Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 24 playthrough of the Buffalo Wings. We are at the midway point of the 2037 season. We are the defending World Series champions, so it's been, I guess, a bit of a down year for us. We're third place in the National League East, a game and a half out. And right now, if the season were to end today, we're in the second wild card spot, uh, two games up on the final wild card spot. So it's been a fine season. It looks like we are on target to make it into the playoffs for a 10th consecutive season, which will be nice. And we're now up to second in the latest power rankings. We've been playing our best baseball of the season since the beginning of June. So as the trade deadline approaches, we talked through at the end of our last episode some of the directions we could go. But the only thing I'm nearly 100% confident that we're going to do is add a left-handed arm to the bullpen at some point. If we could upgrade at center field, if we could find a big-time player for the infield, if there was a great starting pitcher to add... All of those things would certainly make our team better, but right now the prices for any of those types of additions are either exorbitant, in my opinion, or just not possible to pick up that kind of player. So it may end up being a relatively quiet trade deadline for us, and... Uh, it's going to be interesting if we get to the postseason with this team. As those of you who have been watching over the years and recent episodes know, we moved on from Shamar Jenneret last offseason. He opted out of a seven-year contract that he had signed with us after three years. Uh, we had to give him that option to get him uh, to sign with us. And certainly having Jenneret on board turned a good perennial playoff team into a championship team. I mentioned that we're trying to make our 10th consecutive playoff appearance right now. And those first six years without Jenneret, we had a 6-6 six and six series record in the playoffs and never made it further than the National League Championship Series in the three seasons that Jenneret was a member of our team, we had a 7-1 and one record in the playoffs. We made it to the NLCS or beyond every season, and we ended up winning two world championships, during both of which Jenneret won the World Series MVP award. So I agree with the assessment that we're likely a playoff team, but quite possibly not a championship team anymore. But we've got the 20th highest budget in baseball. And if I was going to ultimately sign our ace Alexis Barajas to an extension, which we've now done, and bring back uh, Deshaun Seifu, who we picked overall the one time that we had the number one overall pick, and is well on his way to a Hall of Fame career that will hopefully be spent entirely in Buffalo. If we wanted to do both of those things, uh, there was really no realistic way at all to bring Jenneret back. And even if we only wanted to do one of those things, uh, we would have likely needed to cut scouting and player development down to just ridiculously unrealistic levels. Um, so maybe it was not the perfect baseball decision to let Jenneret go, but I think in terms of an interesting decision for the story that is these Buffalo Wings, Keeping uh, Deshaun Seifu on board trumped uh, bringing Jenneret back, in my opinion. And uh, hopefully we will be in the playoffs this season and for many seasons to come to uh, figure out whether or not we can win a world championship without him. 
So as I mentioned, we're uh, at the midway point in the season and we are coming up on the All-Star game a little over a week from now and then the trade deadline two and a half weeks after that. So uh, the players on the trade block aren't incredibly enticing to us right now, particularly with the uh, prices that are being asked for them. But I think we'll probably uh, see what this team looks like coming out of the trade deadline, uh, coming out of the All Star game, and then uh, really kind of hit things a little more actively as far as trying to uh, piece a trade together over those last two and a half weeks or so of the month of July before we finish up the episode. So that is the game plan. Let's play ball. So we've made it to the All-Star break. Our record stands at 52 and 37. Uh, we're up to second place, one game behind Atlanta, one game ahead of the Phillies now in the National League East. And we are now in the first of the four wild card spots in the National League. Uh, two and a half up on the final spot, so it's still a pretty tight rain, a pretty tight race with uh, looks like about seven teams for those four wild card spots. Deshaun Seifu, who's led the National League in steals nine consecutive years, uh, still in a battle with Jaheim Faggins to win his 10th consecutive stolen base crown. Two behind here as we head to the All-Star break. Uh, other than that, no Buffalo Wings among the uh, top three in the major batting or pitching categories here as uh, we start preparing for the Midsummer Classic. And let's take a look and uh, see who actually made the All-Star team from our Buffalo Wings. Would certainly think that we will have uh, a few this year. Looking at the American League, I, I would have to assume that Jennerette is an All-Star once again. Yeah, it looks like he has been named an All-Star. Uh, his batting average is dipped to 259 this year with Boston. 14 homers and only 34 ribbies. Um, 118 WRC plus is still a very effective offensive season, but only a one war from Jennerette. And after uh, two World Series MVP awards, an AL MVP award, and an NL MVP award, while leading his league in ribbies for four consecutive seasons, uh, a bit surprisingly to see him... Uh, past the midway point of the season with just 34 runs driven in. So uh, maybe he's aging a little quicker than we would have thought, but you look at those contact and home run power ratings and uh, tend to think uh, he's probably just gotten a little bit unlucky, although his BABIP of 304 is actually higher than it was for us a year ago. So uh I still think he's probably a pretty productive offensive player with those ratings, but uh, could be a situation where maybe we uh, we're fortunate to uh, not uh, not end up uh, signing him back after he opted out of his contract with us. Uh, our ace Alexis Barajas is a All Star. Uh, he's coming off of a Cy Young Award winning season last year when he was 17 and seven with a league best 2.39 ERA, uh, seven and six this year with a 2.70 ERA, almost a strikeout per inning and a 2.1 WAR. So he is an All Star once again. Uh, looks like he is our only all-star on our pitching staff, uh, which is a little surprising given how deep and talented our pitching staff is. Uh, Juan Veliz, former uh, big-time player out of our bullpen that we just couldn't afford to bring back this year, was named an all-star from the Mets. Drake Purvis, who we traded away a few years ago as a big piece in the deal to get Barajas from Miami is an all-star as well. Uh, Andres Medina, this for those of you who have been uh, watching this uh, saga in Buffalo over the last several months, um, feels like uh, something that we had hoped would happen for well over a decade. He was a big international amateur free agent signing of ours that we thought was going to be the cornerstone catcher we would build around. 
He was not um, developing as well as we hoped in the minors, so we traded him to the Phillies as uh, the cornerstone of the deal that brought us Andrew Painter, who was a key member of our pitching staff for uh, the better part of a decade. And then we ended up trading back for Medina uh, a few years ago when uh, the Phillies were very deep at the catcher position. Uh, looks like it was uh, four years and one day ago that we made that trade. And uh, Medina has basically been our backup catcher most of that time, although we've tended, given his excellent catcher ability, uh, to start him more often than not in the playoffs over these last three seasons. But uh, this year, we've given him the opportunity in his final year before he becomes a free agent to be our everyday starter. And uh, he has just been named an all-star for the first time, hitting 246 with eight homers. Uh, he is looking for, or he was looking for pretty big money the last time we checked in on him. He had eight years, almost $19 million. Uh, as much as I love his defense, uh, don't know that we'll be in a position to pay that kind of money this off season to bring him back but nice to see uh funky cold medina recognized as an all-star for the first time and that is it for our buffalo wings uh so only two all-stars for the defending world series champions who have won uh two out of the last three world series and when we take a look at the team statistics, uh, we've got the second best offense in the National League. We are middle of the pack in pitching at this point, but uh, the second best offense in the National League and only one all-star. Uh, certainly would think Deshaun Seifu uh, probably would have been worthy of a fourth all-star nod. Uh, as we talked about, he's had an excellent career and with 63 runs, 99 hits, 27 doubles, 7 triples, and 38 steals. Uh, certainly seems plausible, if not likely, that he will end up leading the league in uh, at least one, if not several, of those categories where he has regularly been among the top players in the National League throughout his career. His batting average has dipped to 284, which is the lowest it's been since 2030. Uh, but with his reputation and track record and a three war, uh, a little surprised that the veteran was not named an all-star. But hopefully that will uh, inspire him personally. And the fact that we have only two all-stars this year inspire the rest of the team to... Uh, play with a bit of a chip on our shoulders, not just throughout the rest of the regular season, but hopefully throughout a long playoff run. And we've simmed ahead another week, and we are now tied for first with the Braves, a game ahead of the Phillies. So a uh, very dramatic battle shaping up here in the NL East this year. Uh, could have some of the top teams in baseball uh, when all is said and done. Right now, the Rockies, the Mariners, and the Orioles are the only teams with higher winning percentages than the Braves, Wings, and the Phillies. So conceivably, or almost certainly, two out of those three teams will end up in the wild card uh, rather than having a first-round bye. So it's going to be uh, pretty critical to us to ensure that we can win the division again this year and hopefully set ourselves up for a, a long run in the playoffs. Hopefully, what if we do win the division, hopefully what we've uh, seen in Major League Baseball this year where the uh, top teams or several of the top teams with the buys were uh, kind of routed in their divisional series matchups after that time off will not end up occurring to our Buffalo Wings if we uh, do clinch another NL East title when all is said and done. And we'll take a look here at the refreshed trade block. A uh, couple marginally interesting players to us, a uh, couple big time-ish catchers in Masato Chilcutt but more impressively, Daniel Maldonado uh, on the market. 
Uh, just don't love Maldonado's defense compared to the guys that we have at catcher right now. Could we bring him on board and start him every day to get the bat in there and then use the newly named all-star Medina as a backup? I guess we could, uh, but unless the price for Maldonado is very low, I don't think that move makes a ton of sense. Tadayuki Segakuchi uh, would certainly be a nice left-handed bat for our lineup, but he's a first baseman slash DH. Similarly, 40-year-old Kyle Tucker is still around, and although he's wrecked physically, uh, having a very productive season for the Dodgers with a 164 WRC+, plus, that left-handed bat would also certainly help us but he is a corner outfielder or DH at this point. And when I look at those two big left-handed bats and I look at our roster against right-handed pitching, we've got Mike Heiner and Bobby Bolig at first base and left field. They are both left-handed hitters who are significantly better against right-handed pitching than they are against left-handed pitching. So bringing on one of those other guys is maybe a tiny upgrade to Heiner or Boleg, but I don't think it's something that we're really axed to do at this point. Joe Gallagher, uh, who's the top prospect in our farm system, the number nine prospect in baseball, has got 20 homers and 60 ribbies. Uh, the batting average is only 234, and he strikes out about one-third of the time. But he is a cheap 24-year-old rookie who's still putting up an above-average offensive season. I guess, in theory, we could bring one of those guys on board and move Gallagher out of the starting lineup. It would make us a little bit better this year if the prices for those guys are cheap enough. Maybe I do that. Center field um, would be a logical position since Tim Gaglia has just been moved into that role as our starting center fielder against uh, right-handed pitching in addition to left-handed pitching where he's taken over over the last couple of weeks for Dylan Carlson. But he's been 307 for us this year, above average offensively, and excellent range in the outfield. So I don't feel like I really want to weaken our defense, and Gaglia's hitting over 300 for us. So um, if we brought on particularly... Um, Tucker, we could kind of shift things around. I don't want to play him in center field, though. We're not going to put Juan Estrada in center field. And we're not going to put Bobby Bolig in center field. Um, so I think if we do anything, given that we're not going to take out those lefty bats of Heiner and Bolig against right-handed pitching, if we traded for one of those guys, Gallagher loses his job, which is um, tough to envision for a guy who is probably going to be in the running for the Rookie of the Year award. Um, but a big bat like that would certainly help strengthen us for the playoffs. So I'm at least going to investigate and see what they're looking for. I don't think it'll be anything for us to pursue, but want to kind of turn over as many stones as possible, given that we are still a win-now team. And we do have some money to take on some contracts here as we approach the trade deadline. And I don't think there's anything for us to do. Um, Tucker, even though he's wrecked, that batting profile against right-handed pitching was really attractive to us. But he is a no-trade clause, and he exercised that, so he's not an option. 
Segakuchi, they're looking for a lot for him. I think he would help us a little bit, but I don't want to pay a ton of money right now. And then I also spent some time looking at Vernon Burbage, who's a left-handed hitter uh, who still is pretty good against right-handed pitching, not making a ton of money, and would not take a ton in trade to bring him on board. But when I think about the three ratings that I care about the most, especially for DH, 55 contact, 60 power, and 50 I against right-handed pitching. When we look at where the youngster Edwards is, uh, not Edwards, the youngster Gallagher, I'm always confusing my two guys named Joe. When we look at where Gallagher is, you know, he's got 50 contact a little lower, but 65 power and 60 eye against right-handed pitching which are better so i just don't see burbage really being an upgrade and i think i'd rather continue to give the playing time to gallagher he's certainly more effective against left-handed pitching than he is against right-handed pitching but his profile suggests that he should probably be more than a 234 hitter and maybe as he gets some more experience in the major leagues over the coming of months, uh, we'll, we'll see that pan out. So at this point, I don't think there is a big bat trade that makes sense for us to pursue. In taking a look at the pitchers on the trade block, uh, there's nothing perfect for us. We want a left-handed pitcher for the bullpen. The best left-handed pitcher out there is a starter, Melvin Amador, from the Cardinals. Perhaps not surprisingly, um, although he's got a player option, he's likely to opt out of next year, so it could just be a two-and-a-half-month rental. But perhaps not surprisingly, um, given his pitching profile, despite a three-and-a-nine record, um, for the Cardinals this year. They're looking for an awful lot for him. So I don't think that's realistic to bring him on board, but he is the only left-handed arm on the trade block that's really intriguing to us. Pierce George, and I've talked about this with uh, some of you in the comments, and I mentioned him in previous episodes. He is clearly a big-time pitcher, a three-time Cy Young Award winner, 7-7 seven and seven this year with a 283 ERA, but uh, the only way to get a deal done with the Cardinals to rent him for two and a half months at this point is to give our 28-year-old reigning Cy Young Award winner Alexis Barajas, who is signed through the prime of his career at a pretty reasonable amount, plus the youngster Alexis Mendoza, who's the number 20 prospect in baseball, and looks like he could be a pretty good starter for us and a very cost-effective starter for many years to come. So I'm not going to pay that price for a two-and-a-half-month rental of George, who, best-case scenario, is only a modest upgrade from Barajas. So Chris Bloomquist is the next best pitcher on the market. He is a right-handed closer. He is in the final year of a contract with Nashville. And he has a devastating cutter and an excellent fastball. Doesn't throw incredibly hard, surprisingly, but his movement on his pitches is excellent. The stuff with those two great pitches is excellent, and his control is very good as well. He has been a absolutely dominant pitcher over the course of his major league career with a 140 ERA plus and a 50 FIP minus. So I think we're going to look to bring Bloomquist on board right now simply because he's much more reasonably priced than George, who we really don't need, or Amador, who's the left-hander that we need a little bit more. I don't necessarily love potentially heading into the playoffs with just Lorne Walborn and Matthew Wenzel as lefties out of our bullpen. So I'm going to continue looking for maybe left-handed options away from players who are on the trade block. But 
right now, I think the simplest thing we can do to potentially improve this team is to uh, bring or attempt to bring Mr. Balloonquist on board to really uh, give us another devastating arm for the final innings of hopefully a lot of victories. And we've pieced together a deal for Bloomquist, and we've actually pieced together a deal where we're giving up a bit more, but we're getting Nashville to retain a good chunk of his salary this year to just kind of keep a little bit more financial flexibility for us if we want to try to make another trade over the next week and a half or so, or if uh, we want to ultimately put that money towards trying to sign some of the... Uh, more difficult to sign players we drafted in the later rounds of the draft. So we're giving up some organizational depth in Ambrosi Gaona and Elias Reynoso, uh, but a couple of pitchers, young pitchers with some potential. 21-year-old minor leaguer Jimmy Ring has a nice fastball and a good cutter. Um, 21 years old, does have a 198 ERA and A ball. I don't think that profile suggests he's ever going to be a big major league pitcher. Uh, definitely worried about the lack of control with 44 walks and 77 in a third innings. But if he fully develops, could be a useful left-handed arm. And then Anastasio Ibarra, some of you may remember he was one of our international free agent signings uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, having a good year for us finally in rookie ball at the age of 20 this year, 4-0 with a 191 ERA, but uh, doesn't seem to have a profile that he's ever going to be a big-time major league pitcher. Uh, could one of these guys end up being useful? Sure. Do I expect it? No. Um, so I don't mind uh, including those two, a couple of guys who are just kind of career minor leaguers and then throwing in uh, one other player to get this deal done. So we made the trade for Bloomquist. Um, the lefty Wenzel, in terms of his performance, is the guy that we'd likely send down, but given that he's one of only two lefties out of the pen, uh, likely we'll be keeping him around. So at this point, uh, Mike Waters, the young guy who's still got options, uh, finds himself back on the I-90 drive of shame from Buffalo to Albany. Uh, we send Waters back down to give us the opportunity to put Bloomquist onto the Major League roster and... Um, I think Waters still has an important role to play in our bullpen in future years, but while he's got minor league options, he ends up uh, often being the odd man out. And apart from the lack of uh, maybe three lefties, or at the very least a higher quality lefty than Wenzel in the bullpen, really like how we are in the late innings. We moved Bloomquist into the closer role, kept Lorne Walborn as our stopper, which let us move Elvin Jimenez, who had been closing for us since we lost Mems for the year to that injury, uh, back into a setup role along with Johanny Varejo, Yinger and Polite in middle relief, and then Wenzel and Reynoso in long relief, although honestly Wenzel is really he used more of as a lefty specialist for us. I uh, think it is a very high quality bullpen and uh, our starting pitching is getting better too with uh, all five pitchers now having ERAs under five uh, with Ochoa pitching a bit better of late. And we did kind of try to search for a center fielder who could be a real difference maker for us. Uh, not surprisingly, there's only one player out there, and it's Michael Harris II, who has had an incredible career in this simulation. 36 years old at this point, uh, 326 homers, 1,181 ribbies, 600 steals, uh, 296 career batting average. Uh, 
He hasn't led the league in steals since Deshaun Seifu joined us, though. I will say that. Uh, but he's had an incredible career still uh, with 70 range, is an excellent defensive outfielder, and he's somebody who is very effective against right-handed pitching, making a lot of money, and he does have a vesting option, which given that he's wrecked, we would not want to um, kick in. Fortunately, being that he's wrecked, um, he's only played 60 games this year and he needs to get to 135. So that would be something that uh, is mathematically impossible, I believe, at this point. Um, the issue is that he's not willing to uh, waive his no trade clause. Um, so I don't think we're going to end up uh, doing anything at center field. And I think it's pretty unlikely at this point that we'll uh, adjust our offense at all. I think we're going to try to go with the uh, youngster Gallagher and continue to give him playing time. And uh would be great if there was a Shamar Jenneret out there for us to rent, but I just don't see an option like that. And we've pieced together a deal for a familiar name. And we will get the left-handed pitcher Juan Veliz, who we were just talking about, uh, made an all-star team for the first time with the Mets this year. He was really good for us, uh, but with the off-season we had ahead of us last year, in terms of getting needing to get Seifu signed, ultimately needing to get Baraja signed, we didn't think bringing back a 33-year-old lefty at $7.4 million a year for three years was the right move to make. But the Mets have quickly turned into a rebuilding mode, and they're willing to keep almost half of his contract. Um, we'll give up the lefty Wenzel, who is not as good as a lefty um, in Wenzel, is going to be making about $1.7 million next year. Um, I think he's just a left-handed arm, so we're not getting another left-handed arm, but we're definitely getting an upgrade in our lefty out of the bullpen to join Walborn with Valise, and we're getting him at a much more palatable number of around $4 million a year for the next uh, two and a half seasons. So in addition to Wenzel, we have to include a couple of veterans, and then we have to add in one middling to low-end prospect to get the deal done. So I think we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, so we're going to add the high-quality left-handed arm that we wanted to. Uh, the issue is that we're still just going to have the one lefty in the rotation in, in Estrada and only two lefties out of the pen in Walborn and Valise. But at least the three lefties we have are lefties that we're going to have a ton of confidence in, uh, unlike Wenzel, who I said at this point uh, is what he is and is just kind of a guy. So with the additions of Bloomquist to close and Veliz to be a middle reliever and another really high-quality left-handed arm out of the pen, I think we've probably figured out what we're going to do. Uh, if we have a major injury over the next week or so, or we find that the price on a guy who could help us has just uh, fallen dramatically. Maybe there will be something for us to do. But otherwise, uh, this may be the team that we head into October with. And as we head into the final couple days before the trade deadline, uh, we're now 60-39, and 8-2 and two over our last 10, two games up on the Braves, three games up on the Phillies, and we're actually only a game behind Colorado at this point for the best record in baseball. So uh, we've been playing better baseball, as I talked about at the top of the episode, at this point for almost two months. And uh, definitely don't feel like we need to force anything. If a great deal materializes over the next four days, we'll try to jump on it. But uh, otherwise, I feel like this is a squad that we'll be very happy to go into the postseason with. And we didn't end up 
doing anything else uh, so we have made it to the trade deadline and passed the trade deadline it is august 1st uh, alexis mendoza who as we talked about was a guy that we would have needed to include in that potential trade for pierce george has just won national league rookie of the month for a second consecutive month uh, so i would think with his nine and five record and 3.65 era and the fact that we are still playing gallagher every day and he is up to 23 homers and 71 ribbies with a 111 WRC+. Plus. Uh, we very well could end up having the uh, number one and number two guys in the Rookie of the Year voting this year. Have no idea how rookies are doing on other teams, but would think that both of those two would be very strong candidates. So we are in August now. We are playing good baseball, as I mentioned, our best baseball of the year. 63 and 40 uh, still one game behind the rockies for the best record in baseball but we are up four on the braves and six on the phillies now seifu now four up on faggins in the stolen base race in the national league i wonder if faggins is hurt uh it doesn't look like it but he's been at 42 steals for a little while at this point um don't have anyone else on the leaderboard still, uh, but that said, I uh, feel pretty good about what this team looks like as we head into the final two months of the season. Uh, we've gone 20 and 7 and 18 and 8 each of the last two months. So, as I talked about playing our best baseball of the year, ranked second in the NL now in runs scored, and we've improved to tied for fourth in runs allowed best bullpen in the National League and our starters are now in the top third of the league overall we've got the best ERA in the league so uh, the team is strong not hitting a ton of home runs without Generat. we knew that was going to happen but uh, should be in a good position to hopefully clinch a playoff spot for a fourth consecutive season and hopefully uh, clinch a sixth consecutive national league east title uh, when all is said and done and we will find out uh, whether or not we are able to accomplish that goal in our next episode until then thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day